You see, everything God has done is put there to show you when things are not harmonious with love. So every tiny bit of pain you are experiencing in your life, physical or emotional, is the complete effect of a cause. And if you don't want to see the cause, those pains will continue. Now, we have whole systems on earth totally dedicated to removing effects. The pharmaceutical system on earth is totally dedicated to taking away the effect. Right? We have law upon law upon law that's established in our world politically to take away effects. They don't deal with causes. Is it effective? No. No, because we still keep getting the same effects. Right? And it's amazing how much in every single walk of life, if you analyse it in every single walk of life, sexually, emotionally, politically, environmentally, in all these different areas, in terms of economically, you will see that the whole world is geared towards modifying and changing effects. God doesn't do that. God doesn't touch any of those systems for that reason. Because all God is interested in addressing is causes. Does that make sense? Hi, Jay. Um, when we, we think of prayer and, and asking God things for ourselves, what about when we pray for somebody else? Yep. Um, if somebody's healed and yep. we pray for healing yep. and they are healed, yep. How, how does that all correlate with this? If, if we pray for healing and the person's healed, there are usually one or two things occur. One is that there are many spirits in the spirit world, in the sixth year and lower, who are totally dedicated to healing people on earth who are not dealing with causes. So there are literally billions of spirits in the spirit world who will assist a healing in, of a person that is not addressing the cause of the reason why they got the injury in the first place or the illness in the first place. Does that make sense? It is a total ineffectual waste of energy, though, because in the end, whether the person's healed or not, the emotional cause is still within them. They'll either get the sickness again or another similar sickness, or they'll never address the emotional cause, which is harmful to their soul anyway. So a divine love spirit would never respond to a healing where the cause is not dealt with. Can you see that? But there are like literally billions of natural love spirits who will. And so often when you pray for a healing, it's not God actually doing the healing, but actually a spirit feeling your intention, <coughs> which is an intention of love. But, and so God actually feels your intention of love for the person, certainly. And... And, but it's the spirit who's feeling the same intention and they go and heal that person or attempt to heal that person. That's one set of circumstances. The other set of circumstances is where the person themselves is encouraged by the spirits around them to actually feel their causal emotion about their sickness. Now, under those circumstances, a divine love spirit will assist in the healing of that person and the person will be healed because the person has addressed the cause of the illness within them. Does that make sense? So in each case, there is either an avoidance of dealing with the cause or an actual dealing of the cause, which results in the results given. The issue is, um, obviously, our desire to for somebody else's pain to reduce is a pure desire on our part. But... Oftentimes their pain is the result of their own suppression of emotions that they don't want to face. And so this is where it gets down to what would you do if you were a person with divine love on earth with healing compared to natural love on earth with healing. Well, when you're a person with natural love on earth and doing healing, you'll be tempted to heal anyone you can heal. And there'll be literally hundreds or if not thousands and if not hundreds of thousands of people coming to you for healing. Many of you have heard of John of God, yes? Well, John of God, although he has received some divine love, doesn't understand the principles of divine love, and many times is healing with natural love spirits help. Right? But he also has a divine love spirit helping him heal. And this divine love spirit, which is one of the softest and gentlest spirits that surround him, 
will yeah. only heal when the person who's being healed wants to deal with the causal emotion. Right? And John of God himself doesn't understand why this most sensitive spirit that he recognises as the most sensitive spirit around him actually comes to him under certain circumstances. He doesn't recognise what those circumstances are. But the circumstances are that that person, can, the spirit, can connect through John of God to heal that person because that person is wanting to deal with their causes. And this is a major issue with all, for all of us who are attempting to maybe do healing in the future. And we'll talk a bit about this in the healing sessions in the future as well. And that is, when the person that we're trying to heal doesn't want to deal with the cause, your power is severely diminished to assist them. Because their own physical soul is generating the problem. All illness is the result of the soul having these blocked, blocked emotions, which then create the illness in the physical form and the spirit body, right? So if the person's soul, which is the cause of any emotional, any physical illness, if the person's soul isn't addressed in some way, then the person is going to recreate the same kind of problems and issues. Does that make sense? And so any healing that you do under those circumstances is going to be severely affected by the fact that their soul is working totally the opposite to the way you want it to work. So it's very important if we're, and even in the medical profession, it's very important that we start seeing things with the, at the causal level. If we see things at the causal level, then things can change quite rapidly. Okay. I've got a Vanessa question in my head. Before when you said, um, I want to die, there's a lot of people that want to die. Yep. And God won't do that because that's an effect, isn't it? But yep. Will there be some, is it possible for a person to get to a point where they, because like, as far as that goes, would he whether you lose your material body or not, doesn't, doesn't problem with God, is it? No, but there is a law you're breaking by wanting to die. So, exactly. Remember I said before that God's emotions towards us and our emotions need to be resonant in order for God to respond. Now, if I want to die, but God doesn't want me to, obviously, God wants me. God created me to live, not to die in any sense. And so God also wants me to respect this physical body of my own. So if I then don't respect it, then I'm out of harmony with God's desire for myself. So I'm disconnecting myself from God. And so in every single case, you'll find that there is some kind of disconnection between my thoughts about myself and God's thoughts about me. The key for me is to start addressing the reasons for that. So if I have a feeling I want to die, I need to feel what that's about. So I need to feel the feeling, yes. I need to actually allow that feeling to pass through me, and I need to allow it to be felt, and then I'll connect with the reasons, and I'll probably grieve, and when I do that, the emotion will be gone, and I'll no longer want to die. Is that a lot of people at the end of life who are accepting of the fact that they're dying? Is that different? Um, yeah, having acceptance of, of the fact that you're dying and wanting to die are two different things. But remember too, we're dealing <coughs> right at the moment with an imperfect system because the only reason why these bodies die, these bodies that we have die, is because of the stored unhealed emotions within these bodies. And what often happens is a person gets to a certain age in their life where they have so much stored unhealed emotion within them that they have no desire to actually address and they accept the inevitable that they physical body dies. So they pass. But the problem is when they pass is they still are in the same emotional condition. So they are still in the state of suppressing their emotions. They're still in the state of suppressing the exact emotions that killed them. Right? And unfortunately, because they're in that suppressed state and they never learned how to get out of that suppressed state on earth, they will have a lot of difficulty on, in the spirit world getting out of that state as well. And that's why many of the spirits we have talked to have spent hundreds of years in a suppressed state. Maybe a state of fear or a state, whatever that suppressed state is. Because 
they learned to do that on earth and never got out of that on earth. And when they pass in the spirit world, it's much easier to do something, whether it's suppressive or emotive. So, so when I pass in the spirit world, if I'm used to suppression, I'm going to suppress even more. When I pass in the spirit world I'm on, and I'm trying to open up emotionally, I'll open up emotionally even more. Does that make sense? And that's what's happening with a lot of our physical diseases on earth. Or even just dying from old age. From God's perspective, there is no old age. Right? Our body is totally able to continuously repair itself, as you know, in the medical profession. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, that process degenerates. It, it, it stops happening. Like, it happens all the way through our formative years. It happens all the way through our teenage years. We get into young adulthood and it starts degrading. Why is that? It's because of the emotions that are being suppressed, now suppressed upon the body, shutting the body down, shutting it down at all of its function, and just causing disease in the body, which eventually kills us. And that's why we get our wrinkles and lines across our face. Right? And that's why we get all of these other problems that inside of us that start occurring, because we're suppressing the underlying emotion. Once we address the cause... Many of, us, many of you here will live for hundreds and hundreds of years. If you want. Many of you will. Because you'll get to a point where you'll deal with the emotional causes and you will actually then start growing younger. So you won't be, you won't be 250 years old and your face be like a broom. <laughs> you'll be 250 years old and you'll look like you're 25. <laughs> And you'll feel like you're 25. This is what happens in the spirit world as you go through the different spheres. Once you get to the seventh, sixth sphere of the spirit world, you are normally around the age of 25 in terms of bodily. When you progress beyond that, obviously your soul is expanding in different ways other than affecting the physical form. But, but you will get to a point on earth where you're like that. It's just a matter of working through the causes. It's always the causes. I have a question. You said before that uh, when the child is not okay, that the cause is by the mother. But then you can go from the mother to the mother to the... the to the grandmother of the... Yeah, yeah, how exactly. does it work? I um, mean, somewhere must this cause be taken away, released. Well, remember, these emotions enter each generation. So at each generation, the emotion can be taken away. In the parenting children discussion that we had, um, we've addressed all of those issues of how emotions get transgenerationally imposed upon each generation. And so my suggestion is have a listen to that, that discussion because it, that addresses all of the transgenerational emotional injuries and how they occur and how they can be released as well. So that discussion covers that question. Someone's paralysed on earth. When they pass, are they still paralysed? Um, they may feel their sensations of paralysis, but they will not be paralysed. So, for example, if let's say any condition that happens here on earth, so let's say I had Down syndrome while I'm on earth, when I pass, I may still feel the sensations of Down syndrome, but not actually have it. You can right. move. You can move forward. Yes, in every single case, you can move forward, but. With regard to many of these things, what happens is the spirits get, go across in a certain state, for instance, having Down syndrome, and remain in that fictional state now, because it's only a fictional state, it's not reality. They remain in that state until someone shows them they can get out of that state. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing a lot of the mediumship stuff come, you know, with these mediumship sessions. It's because there are whole groups of people who have passed in the spirit world who are in these fictional states of existence, they believe themselves to be confined to these existences. Mostly because that belief has entered them through their parents, or through their environment, or through their religion. And they are then fixed into a certain state until they have an awareness that that doesn't need to be the case. And what, one, of the reason, one of the main things we'd like to achieve with the mediumship exercises is to actually move them from that state and out into the awareness state where they don't have to be constrained by those illnesses. So there are many people who die of cancer on earth who still believe themselves to have cancer in the spirit world, for example. 
And it's only when they realise or somebody just tells them or, you know, through their interactions with other people that that's not the case that they begin to progress and work on the emotion that caused them to have the cancer, for example. Would Gloria, for example, know now she has arrived in the third world and she had done quite an amount of work here, she didn't want to do all of the work to, do, to remove the colors of the cancer, but yep. she is well aware of how it goes. Gloria it did it. Yeah, Gloria did a lot of emotional work yes. about other issues other than her cancer. But unfortunately, she did not deal with the main issue that was affecting her cancer. And so she passed because the cancer eventually uh, killed her. Now, when she passes into the spirit world, usually the first, you know, the first week or two in the spirit world, you go through these emotions of, oh, having a lot of freedom for a start. Now, for many who pass with cancers or other diseases, they kept, they kept asleep for many for a long time. Mm -hmm. But in case of someone like Gloria, because she knows a lot about the spirit world through her learning, it's unlikely she'd be kept, kept asleep. So what would normally happen is she'd be firstly flitting around to all the people on earth, checking them all out. What does this person really feel about me? What does that person really feel about me? <laughs> and honestly, you find a lot of really revealing things when you, when you do that. You, you will notice this when you pass. And, and, uh, and so you, you, you find a lot of so-called truth out, you know, that you weren't aware of when you were here. You find out how really people, people really think of you and how they really feel about you. There's a lot of emotions that come up during that process, obviously. Then you go through this phase, usually after your memorial service or you know after the first week or so, you go through this phase of settling, sort of settling into the spirit world. And uh, and I talked to Gloria, and she hadn't even uh, looked at herself in the mirror yet. You know what I mean? So so I encourage you to do that because when you look in the mirror, you can see the different areas of your spirit body that are affected by emotion. And so when she did that, she could see that actually she still had the <coughs> cancerous emotion. Right. So now she's going through a little phase of anger about that. Right. Anger that with all the emotional work she did, she still didn't access the cancerous emotion that caused her own death. Once she gets through that phase of feeling those emotions, what she'll do is she'll come to it to realise actually that what the emotion was, and she, she can easily be told by another spirit what the emotion is. It's an emotion of wanting men to do what she wants by getting them to do it through through manipulative means. And uh, and once she works through that emotion, right, which she could probably do in a day or two, actually, and to be frank, could have done in a day or two or a week or two on Earth she as well. Wasn't even aware of that. No, she was aware because I've told her about the emotion. Oh. Yeah. So so I've spoken to her specifically that that was the emotion. Well, but she must have really denied it. Because exactly. To the end, she would not admit that that was the emotion. No, she even had dreams about that being the case, but but did not affecting her emotionally. So and also, of course, like in her living environment, you know, where she was living, no one around her wanted her to believe that either. Of course, because when you when you start looking at a lot of emotions within yourself and you start feeling them, you start feeling really terrible about yourself, and and a lot of people obviously don't want that to happen when you're going through cancer or something like that. So so a lot of times people around us also shut us down from actually experiencing the emotion. But she'll probably go through that emotion in a week or two. And once she's gone through that emotion, because she's already received a lot of divine love, she'll move to a new location. right? And once she's in the new location, she's just going to have a wonderful time progressing after that, you know, working through other emotions. Because once you learn how to work through the first one, Obviously, the other ones that are there become a lot more simple to work on. So that's generally what happens to many people who pass. Like, they go through this initial phase of, you know, joy, flitting around from here to there, talking to everyone they can who's mediumistic and all that kind of stuff. And then they go through this phase of realising, yeah, yeah, of actually feeling a realisation of what my condition is. And then they go through a phase generally of either denying that or wanting to deal with that. And then they go through, you know, the process. Once they learn how to deal with it, either on the natural love path or the divine love path, usually they follow that same path in dealing with any other issue. But we're a bit off the subject, Fred. <laughs> and actually, it's three o'clock. So what we'll do, I want to address this issue of causes far more with you after the break. But if we can have a half an hour, 40 minutes or so break, and 
It's so nice to see you just reflecting love for other people. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping things I'd like to talk about before we get started again. And that way I won't have to talk about them just when you're going home. Um, many of you have been looking for the pageant messages in printed form. Um, there's a lady in, oh, sorry, a man in uh, Arizona who Joseph Babinski, his name is, and he compiled all of the pageant messages in um, chronological order. And then a lady in Australia, Zara Borthwick, her name is, um, published this volume, which you can find on Lulu. So it's www.lulu.com. It's $54 US. Um, it's cheaper on Amazon. Uh, it's, cheap, it's cheaper on Amazon, so it might be better at postage on Amazon. Joseph actually admits that he even recommended us to Amazon. Yeah. Um, and uh, by the way, if you will get contacted by Zara if you buy this book, and Zara doesn't like me very much at this point, so I'll just warn you that in advance. John, Joseph himself has made five volumes in chronological order, but they're, they're smaller, smaller books, so they're a bit easier to take travelling with you or whatever. And a book, I think he's got five books, and they're based on the date, so 1914, 1915, 1916, and so forth. And they're also valued for about the same price, I think, all up. So when you add them all together, you get about the same price. So the pageant messages that are on the Divine Truth disc, are they all there or do you get extra when we buy that book? Or? Uh, no, these are all of those pageant messages that are edited to be in chronological order. All the stuff that's on the discs is not in chronological order. So the beauty of having it in chronological order is that you actually see the development of pageant as a medium. Uh, through the discussion, so it's a, I, I do feel that reading them in chronological order is actually pro you'll probably find it much more interesting. Uh, whereas the the way the other pageant messages are generally put together is by subject or or some other method. Um, whereas these are all in just the chronological order. No, no, they're not. Um, it's it, they're very on this one book. If you get the one book, they're in very small type, and so you know, if you're hard of reading or whatever, you may find that the five books are better. The five books are actually smaller, but uh, I think the type is a little larger, and um, they're also probably more carryable. You know, in the sense of if you chuck it in a handbag or something like that. Whereas this obviously is a pretty unwieldy piece of equipment, but. They are available in printed form, should you wish to read them. My suggestion is to read them, um, if you haven't already begun doing so, you will find them very enlightening. And with all the material that we've been through together so far, you'll find that uh, you'll understand what's going on in the messages quite well, and you'll also feel a deep connection to some spirits uh, as well as your reading, so that it, it will pull up your feelings towards it. Pete? Since I started reading them, I didn't really get into the disc so much on the computer, but since I've started reading them for the last week or so, I've really got totally captivated by them. I was through the first couple hundred pages, doing it every night for an hour or more, and it, you know, it really is fantastic. Yeah. 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 I, I had mine printed up, and I just read one or two before I go to bed, and it's just a really nice note to end the day on, so yeah. it's a good space to sleep. Yeah, you'll find uh, as you read them, it will just connect you with the higher truths, uh, and so your your soul will sort of sing you. Uh, yeah, uh, on Amazon, I think, uh, and also Lulu and Lulu are both are both available in both of those sites. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to mention to you before we get started again is uh, many people are now starting to get interested in maybe having some kind of divine love community. Um, so there's been an idea of uh, buying some land, maybe maybe 600 acres or 1,000 acres or so, and then putting together some kind of communal living type thing where people are focused on dealing with their emotions and working through stuff together and, and also um, preparing for the future in terms of what life will be like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a divine love sense, in a real, you know, in a real environment. And, 
Um, so what we're thinking of doing is actually having a discussion um, uh, where I'll present a lot of the things that happen in the spirit world about living in communities. And, uh, and also some physics, some suggestions about how to make that happen on Earth. Um, now, um, we were thinking about when to do that. Um, and there is, there is uh, some people already looking at, at land and things like that, so... Uh, Talk about that block. <laughs> there's, a, there's a block that's about a kilometre away from where I live, that's uh, 600 acres. Um, which would be ideally suited to that kind of living. Uh, sorry, is it called Bethany? <laughs> and uh, it, it's it's um, it's quite because of where I live, uh, land is a lot cheaper than what you have here on the coast. Um, six hundred acres is four hundred thousand out there, whereas six hundred acres here is more like three or four million probably. <laughs> um, it's a uh, it, it's something that uh, what I'd like to do is just. Pre I don't want. I don't want to do it for you. Um, I don't want to actually. I might actually invest or, or be a part of it in the sense that myself and Mary feel like we would like to have a lot of locations around the earth that we don't actually own, but we actually have a home to visit when we're in that particular part of the earth. And um, and so, it being near where we live currently. Um, we feel that the whole region of where we live currently, or I feel, I should probably say, Mary hasn't had too many feelings about this, but I feel where we live currently is going to be one of the centres um, of spiritual development in the future, and that's one of the reasons why I chose land out there. And it also is ideally suited to earth change stuff uh, in terms of what will happen with regards to earth changes. And, and that being said, I don't want you to focus on earth changes as the motive. Um, because the, the motive should always be soul development, whatever you do. Um, but I would like to discuss with you some principles about how things operate in the spirit world, but also some principles about how to actually have something happening here on the earth where people can work through emotions and prepare for earth change events, and, but, but also in the process, do all of their emotional processing. And so what we would like to do is probably arrange a time when we can do that, that would suit the majority of the people who would be interested in being a part of that kind of a project. And um, please bear in mind that I'm not selling this project. <laughs> All right? um, I just, I'm just saying I'll present some principles to you. Jenny? Money shouldn't be an issue. No. Money's not an issue. When you have your desire, um, you'll find the funds will come anyway. So, so if you feel the, the reason why money also is an issue is because um, this uh, property uh, around six hundred acres or so would support easily thirty to forty um, people on it, uh, families on it easily. And so, you know, we could easily have thirty to forty people investing, like you know, ten thousand dollars a piece, for example, initially, and uh, and. And then we could, and then we'll just see how it goes from there on. And the best way for me to do this is explain it to you in detail rather than giving you a brief overview right now. So the key thing is when do we do this detailed discussion? Um, straight away, straight away <laughs> most people are saying. And tonight, <laughs> uh, I might need a rest tonight. What we were thinking: um, how many of you have travelled here some distance? And I'm only staying for the weekend, like, so quite a few, okay. Um, yeah, we might, can we make it maybe tomorrow morning um, at about 10.30 uh, or something like that? Um, for those who are interested. Um, you're interested? Um, Hands up those people who are interested and can come, and those people who are interested in Who's interested and can come if it happened, say, about uh, maybe 10.30 tomorrow morning? Um, who who it would be able to come if it was like... Uh, well, tomorrow night's going to be a bit hard for me because I've just have spoken for four hours, so... 
you say goodbye, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we were thinking maybe Monday evening, but uh, obviously all those people who travelled won't be able to make that. Yeah, but then we have to find a venue, and, and Peter and Claire won't be here either, so they're overseas. So. Tomorrow morning. What about tonight? I ask how many people are actually interested in the whole thing. How many are interested in the whole thing? How many of you won't be able to make it tomorrow morning? It's quite a lot. Okay. How many of you could, if we had a break, uh, if I finished off, say, at five ish, and I said that we meet again at seven tonight? How many, or 7.30 tonight, how many of you could make that? Could everyone make that? No. Okay. So whatever we do, we're going to miss out on something. Well, it's going to be hopefully recorded. So anyway, those of you miss out are going to perhaps listen to the recording. So let's make it, uh, can we make it 10.30 in the morning then? Uh, tomorrow morning? So how many of you will make it if it's 10.30 tomorrow morning? Okay, so the majority. How many of you won't make it but you would be interested still if it was 10.30 tomorrow morning? So that's the least amount. So, okay, so that's our best bet is to do that tomorrow morning at 10.30. So what I'll be talking about is, is um, firstly, just talking about um, some principles about what will happen in the future once people are at one with God. Um, so I want to give you a bit of a skeleton. And the reason why I want to give you a bit of a skeleton about what we will be doing here on Earth when we're at one with God is because many of you have never heard me discuss those matters um, and also probably are thinking in quite limited ways uh, than what um, I'm actually thinking. <laughs> and so what we'd like to do is to just expand your mind a little bit that for, for the first, say, half an hour to an hour. And then the last half an hour, we'd like to present a little bit of information maybe about some, about some principles of what to look for if you're interested in setting up such a thing and being a part of such a thing. And the reason why we'd like to tape it is because we feel that there will be probably people around the world who would be interested in doing and setting up similar things. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a background about that. So by the sounds of it, some of you are quite uh, keen about it. Is that, yeah. Would that be right? Yeah. That's good. I think it's a wonderful idea myself. Yeah. Um, but of course it depends very much on how it's managed. Many of you who have previously lived in communities know there's a lot of infighting generally. And you also know that, you know, when there's a committee structure, what happens is the person at the lowest common denominator in terms of development usually is what everybody conforms to. So in other words, the person who yells the loudest and screams the longest is the person who gets what he wants. And that's not what we want to occur in this situation. Obviously, that's not harmonious with divine love. And so what we're going to do is stretch your feelings quite a lot when it comes to this community idea. So when we present that tomorrow, um, I'm sure you'll feel a little different. Now, some of you are going to be very, very challenged because many of you are so used to having control. <laughs> Who loves control? <laughs> and particularly many of you are very used to having financial control <laughs> and so there are certain issues that will be faced in all of that for you emotionally and uh, I'm not saying that I want financial control because I don't want any control <laughs> um, but I'll be one of those persons who will be being controlled um, but the, the situation will be more based around what's harmonious with divine love so that's why I want to tell you a little bit about how the spirit world works in terms of communities and, and, and cities, even in the spirit world. Does that sound interesting enough? Yes. Okay. And um, probably won't be long enough, an hour and a half, you know how I go on. But um, we might, what we may finish up doing is with the mediumship discussion, maybe starting a little later if we finish the other one in 12.30 or something like that and have a bit of a break. So we'll have probably a day tomorrow starting 10.30, break about 12.30 to 1.30, starting at 1.30, maybe have a break about 3.30, 4.30, start again to 5.30, something like that. Something like that is probably how the day is going to pan out. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Thanks for bringing on. Well, let's get back to these, uh, the really important discussion. 
A lot of you are keen about that, eh? <laughs> and, you know, the first, the first thing that makes anything happen is desire, is it not? So that's really, really, really lovely. And, and to be frank with you, there are many, I've already selected many locations around the world for these kind of things to occur. Um, so I've got locations that I've got in my mind that I haven't told anybody about in different places around the world. And uh, there are three locations that I've got in my mind in Australia. Um, one's on the West Coast, two are here, and then there are ones uh, overseas in different countries. Um, that I've got my heart set on. So we'll see what happens in time with all of those. In South America? Yeah, South America. I've got some. There's one in Barbados as well that I've got my eye on. And there's uh, one in Canada, one in the USA. Um, I'm looking at Vietnam as well. South Africa. So hopefully in the end, what I'm looking for for myself is a little tiny cabin in each one of these locations. But it actually won't be a cabin. My concept of a cabin and yours are probably a little different. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, many of you would have had some uh, dreams or visions uh, at some time in your previous existence, up until this point, of uh, domed-based structures. Uh, many of you probably uh, had visions of these things. And the reason why is that there's been a heavy influence from the spirit world about that. So in the end, what we'll be doing is creating some very unique, special structures on these, on these blocks of land. So what we do at this stage is just temporary. So that's the other thing you'll need to keep in mind in our discussion tomorrow. Will you be teleporting around the world? That's the idea. <laughs> oh, you will be doing it. We'll have a whole... <laughs> We'll all cruise around. <laughs> Is there any problem with that, do you? No. No. Yeah. no, you don't worry about it. By then, authorities won't worry about it. <laughs> well, you think about it. With world change events, they're going to be too worried about a lot of other things than worried about you flitting from place to place. So, so, in the end, there won't be anything like, you know, visas or passports or all those things. You wouldn't be able to carry them on you anyway because you will arrive in most places naked, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you decided to not telephone again. The other thing I forgot to mention is that you can materialise clothes if you do it, so. <laughs> I just thought I'd scare you a bit first. <laughs> Deal with those body images. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alright, well, let's get back to the discussion about prayer. The, the important thing we were just discussing before we broke was this issue of cause and effect. And that prayers about causes are the most important thing to remember. And if you start thinking about it from a purely reasonable point of view, you can understand why God operates in this way. Because if you were operating from the point of view that you were fixing up effects all the time, you, you imagine God being going around to everybody, everybody's life, fixing up all the effects constantly, like... He'd be one very busy God, would he not? Yeah. Particularly with the amount of damage one of us can do, let alone, right? So he'd be going around, you know, fixing up all of the effects in your life. And the problem with that is that it creates people who don't care about what they're doing. Yeah. And so one of the primary reasons why God only addresses causes mm -hmm. is because he wants you to understand what you're creating. Remember, one of the things in this growth on the Divine Love Path is about you becoming a creator. So at the beginning you feel you're not creating very much at all, but actually you are creating lots of things. It just happens to be many painful things. And then as you grow... <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing about that. <laughs> but then as you grow, you sort of go to a state where you start creating... You start creating things that are far less painful and far more imaginative and creative and, and beautiful. And so 
So as that process occurs, if you're not aware of the effects of your creations, you can do some very big damage, can't you? Not only to your own lives, but to the lives of others. So God is very interested in making sure that you understand the effects of what you create. So what better way for you to understand the effects of what you create than actually you feel the effects of what you create? So a lot of God's laws are actually based around you feeling the effects of your own creations. So if there are painful creations, then it is because I am out of harmony with divine love in some way. And I need to feel the effect of my painful creations. So if I'm experiencing personal pain, I need to understand, whatever the pain is on a physical or emotional level, I need to understand that that is the effect of my own creation. Now once I understand that basic principle, I am now very careful about making sure that all of my creations are harmonious with love. And that is the reason why God addresses prayers that are to do with causes and not to deal with effects. If he dealt with effects, you could go on creating all of these very painful things and not have any painful result to yourself, which would actually be quite damaging to your environment and to yourself. So it's very important that you understand that there are effects and God can't solve effects for you. You need to deal with the causes. God can help you with the causes. So pray about the causes. Other reasons, uh, other you notice down through the list of contents that will be heard, by, or prayers that will be heard by God, I've got prayers that are harmonious with free will. Many times you see people praying for things that are not actually harmonious with the free will of others, or even their own free will. One that you brought up earlier was that issue of, I want my God's will to be my will. Now God doesn't want you to do that. God wants you to express your will in its most powerful form, which will be when you are completely in harmony with divine love. That's what God wants. So God wants you to work out what you want. And if it's in disharmony with love, deal with that emotionally. If it's harmonious with love, act upon it immediately. That's what God wants for you to do. So if I'm praying that God tell me what God's will is for me, all God can really say to me is, actually, my will for you is that you find out what your will is. <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, that's really all God can say. And then find out not only what your will is, but if it's harmonious with love, go and do it. If it's not harmonious with love, deal with the emotions inside of yourself that cause you to feel the way you feel. That's really all God can say to us with a prayer like that. But if we start praying about things like um, affecting other people's will, for example, you know, um, oh, I know who my soulmate is. God, can you just make him, <laughs> or her, you know, want to know me or want to love me? You know? Cupid, draw back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do I do I do? That's a prayer, but, but what you're basically doing is asking somebody, asking God to change somebody's heart for you. Yeah. Now, can God do that? No. Obviously not, right? So, so you can't let you know, yourself believe that God is actually going to change other people for you. However, you could pray that whatever the emotions are within your soulmate that causes your soulmate not to have a soulmate connection, that your soulmates assisted in dealing with those emotions, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. right, that's certainly a valid prayer in harmony with love. Can you see the difference? Mm -hmm. One is saying, you know, do this for me. The other one is saying, do it for the person. Right? What, you know, help the person. There are many times when we break the law of free will when we're praying. And that we're often not aware of it. And the key, of, the key is to become aware of the law of free will. For example... How many times have you prayed for truth in your own life, but you personally know the truth about someone else that you've not said? How many times have you prayed for truth in your own life, and yet you know a truth about somebody else's life, and you've not told them? Can you give an example of what you mean? Uh, example. 
And let's say I have a friend in a in a marriage in a marriage, and I know her husband has cheated on her. Now, most people would say that's none of my business, and I'd have to disagree. Right? The reason why it's my business is because I know the truth, and I'm not saying it. Right? And there should be no reason why I don't say the truth, even if it means losing a friendship. Does that make sense? Now, if I'm praying at that same moment to receive truth myself, it's very hypocritical because I'm actually holding on to a truth that the other person needs for their life. Right? And in fact, the man who cheated on his wife and the wife needs for their life, actually, to heal their life. Now, I can be praying in that way, um, praying for, for the other person to get to know something, but if I personally know it myself, what am I doing? Aren't I just ignoring the fact that I, that I might be the messenger of truth for that person? So if I'm praying for things that other people's free will will be impacted on. So for example, in that situation I just gave, the free will of the husband and the free will of the wife is being impacted by my choice not to say anything. Now how does that work? How it works is the wife who does not know that her husband has cheated might have made a different choice in her life if she knew, would she not? Like, she may decide to forgive him, but she also may decide to leave him. Now, she may, if she had that information, make a different choice than she's currently making. So, if I don't tell her the truth, can you see I have control over her free will to an extent? Can you see that? Can you see how me not saying something actually means that I've made a decision for her? And if I've made a decision for her, so whatever that decision might be, oh, she might not cope with it, or I'll feel responsible for their marriage breakup, or, you know, who knows what, they, they, she may not believe you, and you may lose a friend, whatever, whatever it be. Whatever that is, whatever the underlying emotion is, I have broken the law of free will. I have not enabled this woman to make a choice. In all of my interactions with every person, I will always enable people to make a choice if the person wants to hear the truth. So you could go up to the person and say, do you want to hear the truth about what's going on in your relationship? She could say, no. Okay. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? But if she says yes, then of course you'll speak it. As a relationship counsellor, I took the oath of confidentiality. Well, when you, who is it? What is an oath about? An oath is a promise. Yep. So you should always keep promises. However, I would never make a promise of confidentiality. Can you see why? Like, does God want everything to be confidential or transparent? God wants everything to be transparent. So, if I may take an oath of confidentiality, what I'm actually doing is enabling the person to stay in denial of some emotions within themselves. And I'm a party to that act. Can you see that? Now, now most, most lawyers do this, most religious people do it, most counsellors do it, and so I'm not saying what you do with your life is totally up to you, right? But what I am saying is, is the oath in harmony with divine love or divine law? From God's perspective, is everything confidential? Nothing's confidential, is it? God knows absolutely everything. Every single thing that happens. Often confidentiality causes problems. Can you see that too? So, for example... If I, you know, if I know something about one person and the, and the other person, they don't want to tell each other. Firstly, obviously, if I'm loving, I would go to the first person and say, please, you know, you, I know you know this. I feel this about it. I need to tell, you know, my other friend, whether it's your wife, husband, whatever, I need to tell them, but I'd prefer that you do it. Um, you could give them that option. But in the end, um, my feelings are, I don't care about confidentiality. So I'm sorry about that. 
for everyone who's challenged by that. Now, let me address this issue a little further and give you more detail. We often make an oath of confidentiality in order to encourage people to be open with us, do we not? Why do they need that encouragement? Because they're going to be afraid of being judged most of the time. Is that not the case? But if I'm in a state where I'm not judging anyone, then that takes that away, doesn't it? So I'm not judging anyone. What is the thing that is going to help them access their emotions the most? Truth. So if I'm denying truth in their life by helping them or assisting them denying truth in their life, aren't I a party to suppressing their emotion? Probably yes. Now, this raises huge amounts of issues that doctors, lawyers, you know, counsellors, doesn't it? It's like, it changes the whole ballpark. And in fact, you would often be disbarred if these kind of things happen in a doctor, you know, patient setting or... But, but I can't do, I can't fix that for you. I can, all I can do is tell you what God's principles are. That's all I can do. I can't actually change how you work it. So how you work it's up to you. But understand that if you take an oath of confidentiality, the oath is actually, um, from God's perspective, a breach of some of his divine laws. How you deal with that is up to you. I'm not telling you what to do about that. I'm just informing you that that's the case. Can you understand why, though? Can you see how the laws of truth are compromised? Can you see how the laws of emotion are compromised? Can you see how even the laws of um, free will are compromised? Like, there's quite a few laws compromised by, by holding something confidential when you know it would benefit another person or they may make a totally different decision if they knew the truth. You see, what happens today in almost all forms of therapy and counselling and in many doctor-patient relationships and lawyers in particular as well is nobody wants to take responsibility for how they feel. What does God want you to do? Take responsibility for how you feel. So if I'm assisting people to not take responsibility for how they feel, I'm really assisting people to do exactly the opposite of what actually God wants them to do. Can you see that? So this is a very hard issue for many of you in those professions to address. And the key is to allow yourself to feel through the issues emotionally like every other issue. So as you receive divine love, you'll feel at some point the divine love will stop flowing until you address these issues in your day-to-day -day life. And then allow yourself to work through them as, you, as those issues are triggered in you. Okay? Um, I gave some information to two other people and then asked them not to talk about it to other people. Yep. Have I asked them to do the wrong thing? Yep. Because <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you doing? You're asking them to not exercise their own free will. So is that... Is that like, if you feel that you wanted to have that not told to other people. You shouldn't have told them in the no. first place. Do you know what I mean? Like, like as soon as, as soon as I'm asking somebody else to actually deny the operation of their own free will, I've just broken a law. They're allowed to do whatever they want with any information that I give them. They can even falsify a lot of it and tell a million people. And in fact, that would be my law of attraction if they did it, to trigger an emotion within me. Does that make sense? So, yeah, don't need to ask. The only reason why we ask those kind of questions is because we are afraid of the results. And so it's a fear-based decision. Um, and? Um, can I hear it a bit louder? <coughs> Um, you yourself know truths about people, don't you, that if you spoke them could blow everyone's cover? And, <laughs> and, and though you don't speak them often? I mean, you speak the truth to me, but I could ask you things that you probably know about my life, like who sexually abused me, could just, you know, but you wouldn't say that? Um, yes, there's times when I do know things about your life. 
that perhaps even you don't know. But um, a lot of the times I won't... I'm perfectly happy to tell you the truth, but as long as I can feel from your soul that you want the truth. Right? So, so and, and this is a bit different than this other issue that we were discussing, and, and we'll, we'll talk about why. In one instance, we're talking about the person's own decision in their own free will. So when I'm relating to you, I am actually relating to your free will. So if Gary cheated on you, right, and I knew about it, then I would certainly say that to you. Right? But if you can, and if you come and ask me personal things about your life, whatever I can do to help you, I will try to help you. Sometimes, though, um, the help is for you to trust your own feelings about that. So a lot of people come and ask me questions and say, oh, what do you feel about that? And I ask them back, what do you feel about that? <laughs> right? Because they need to know how to exercise their own free will rather than trying to trust mine all the time. Now, I am still dealing in truth with you right? by saying, no, I am not going to tell you. <laughs> I do know, but I am not going to tell you is a truth. So did Gary cheat on me? Has Gary cheated on me? <laughs> Do you feel that's the kind of thing to ask in a public setting? <laughs> Why would you have an emotive of asking that question in a public setting? What's the motive? Isn't the motive to punish Gary? So is that motive in harmony with love? So why would I answer it? Because, sorry, you need to... Oh, sorry, you, you would answer it in private? If I knew the answer for certain, yes, I certainly would answer it in private. Yeah. But I see no point in asking, answering it publicly. And in fact, I see some major emotions in yourself asking the question publicly. Does that make sense? Which I would firstly like to address. So if I was in truth, I would be addressing those emotions firstly. If I, if I do know, like, why would I raise, if I was loving a person, why would I raise a, a, a private, like, what I know they would feel is a private issue in a public setting? There would only be one reason, and that is they have already risen it in a public setting. They have already brought it up in a public setting. So you'll notice, generally, when I'm dealing with questions and answers with people, if a person brings up something in a public setting, I will generally address that in a public setting. If they're breaking up in a private setting, I'll generally address that in a private setting. But the motive is always to actually help the person become more loving. It's not to expose a person or to harm them or to you know, cause any other damage in their life. However, if I know something about something that's going on in your life and I feel it's important for you to know, right? now I'm making a decision for you. And I don't believe in making decisions for you. I believe you should be able to make the decisions for yourself. But isn't that, isn't that the same as, like, if you know someone, like if it's a husband and wife and you're a friend and you know they've cheated, aren't you making the decision for them yes. by telling them? Um, no. It, like, remember right at the beginning I said, if you're a friend of this couple, right, I don't know if you remember that, but that's what I said. There's a couple you know who's a friend, who are friends of yours, right? So, like, I know, like, often walking past a person down the street that he just cheated on his wife last night. I know if a woman's been raped that day or whatever. But I don't know those persons. They don't know me. And they're not asking for my assistance or help. Do you follow me? And there's nothing I can prove in a court or anything like that in those situations. But if I know this couple and I love them both, then I will certainly want to help address the issue if I love them both. Of truth. But didn't you just say that was taking away their... No, I want to enable their free will. By enabling their free will, I'm giving them the choice of making decisions. There's a lot of stuff coming back at me now. <laughs> so be honest. Say what you feel. Jen? Does that mean that to stay on the divine law path, the things that I consider private, 
They don't need to become public, but you need to not have any emotion about them becoming public. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. So, for example, Luther, when he was on earth, you know, you know Martin Luther, not, I'm talking about the founder of the Lutheran religion, Luther. And when he was on earth, he made lots and lots of terrible statements about women. I don't know if you know that. Um, you know, he made statements about women should, women weren't being worth anything more than being kept pregnant and in the yeah. home and things like this. He made a lot of really, really derogatory statements about women. He's now one of my celestial brothers. Do you think that he, that he cares that I just made that statement to you? Why? Because it's the truth. But it is the truth. Right? And the truth is, we should be able to make statements about any single person here as long as they are truthful. Do you know what I mean? And that and why would it then affect anyone? Now it'll only affect them if they have an emotion, won't it? That's in disharmony with truth. It's also the intent. Yeah, if the intent is well like if the intent is unloving, in other words, is to hurt the person, then straight away I've broken another law. Myself. So I've spoken the truth, which is not breaking a law, but if my intention was to harm a person in speaking the truth, now I have broken another law. Does that make sense? So obviously I need to have a look at my intention in doing it. What's my intention? I need to really analyse my intention. So let's say I'm in a situation of counselling, and a person comes to me, husband and wife come to me in a counselling session. The husband says, oh, I want to talk to you privately. My first question would be, why? <laughs> like, and my second probably question, my answer would be, no. Like, why would I enable the person to speak privately in front of his wife when he meant to have some kind of close relationship with this person? What is he afraid of? So that's the next thing I would address with him. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid she might leave me if I tell you what I'm going to tell you, or whatever it is that he's afraid of. So he needs to work through that fear, does he not? Don't enable people to cover up their lives, is basically what I'm saying to you. Because when you do that, you're enabling people to break the laws of God. Don't enable people to break the laws of God. It's not your responsibility to correct everything, but it is your responsibility to correct everything that comes into your sphere of operation. That's your law of attraction. Does that make sense? So it's not my responsibility to correct somebody's life I don't know anything about. But it is my responsibility to correct anything that comes into my law of attraction and deal with that openly and honestly and truthfully. Can everyone see the, the difference? Louise. Angie, you know, since you brought this issue up about, you know, speaking the truth about someone you know who's had an affair, God did a project, a huge project with this older man, a very spiritual man, and he had many affairs, including tragic with me as well. Yeah. I've had lots of fear come up about you know, speaking the truth. Um, and is it for me to do that? I'm not the closest person. The key for you, firstly, is to work through all of your fears about speaking the truth. Now, many of you have some very deep fears about speaking the truth. Do you not? Like, many of you have got little skeletons in the closet. Don't want anybody else to know about, right? This is how it is for most of our lives. Now, now what's the underlying motivation emotionally to not tell the truth? Okay. Fear. Fear is, is it, isn't it? In the end? Fear. Is fear harmonious with truth? No. no. Is fear harmonious with love? No. no. So as soon as I'm clicking into fear as a motive for holding on to something, I am now out of harmony with love and truth. Can I see that? Okay. So once I've, I'm in this state of fear, obviously now I'm motivated by the fear. And I'll come up with all sorts of intellectual arguments. And in fact, when we discuss this emotions of self-deception thing that we're talking about next month, fear is one of the emotions of self-deception. You choose to have fear so you don't have to deal with other things. Does that, everyone follows that? I, I'm choosing to be afraid of truth uh, because I don't like what telling the truth is going to do. So I choose to be afraid of the truth. 
once I'm in there, am I in love anymore? No. I'm just out of harmony with love from that moment on. Does that make sense? Now, for, for your question, Lewis, so you're afraid to speak the truth. Yeah, I really am. So yeah, let I, yourself I, now... I don't think I'll ever speak to him again. All right, so yeah. that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I've had lots of people kill me and then speak to me again. So you don't need to worry. People will always speak to you again. I'm fair thinking, right? Yeah. So, fear is the motivation. Fear is the motivation because there is something you're afraid of. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, what, we're talking about prayer now. So, what, what would we do first? We would pray to God about dealing with the fear in yourself as to why you don't feel like you can say truth. Does that make sense? And pray to God that you develop a longing in yourself to have the law of attraction bring you truth so that you can confront this fear that you have about truth. Do you follow me? So it's not just about you, it's about fear of speaking the truth in my life. It's about fear of speaking truth in your life and what the results are going to be. Yeah. All of these fears are, remember, childhood related. Right? So something happened in your childhood that absolutely terrified you about truth. Yeah, I didn't know anything about any kind of emotion. Exactly, exactly. And the only way you're going to get closer to God is to actually deal with that emotionally. Does that make sense? So, in other words, I've got to somehow work through these childhood fears about truth. How am I going to do that if I don't confront issues of truth in my day-to-day -day life? If I ignore every truth in my day-to-day -day life, will I ever deal with that childhood emotion? No. Now, I can pray to God, please give me your truth, and if I'm not dealing with the fear about my childhood truth, What's happening? I am straight away in disharmony with the prayer I've just asked. So you're allowed to choose to be in disharmony with your own prayers. But you're not going to get anywhere. It's just a waste of time. Does that make sense? Do you incur a penalty? Do you incur a penalty? Well, you're already in the penalty. Isn't the penalty the fear that you have about truth? See, underneath that fear about truth is an actual childhood experience which you, which you don't want to release. So the fact that you're in fear about it is that's the actual penalty. That's the law of conversation. It will continue and continue and continue and continue until you decide to be repentant and deal with it a different way or start confronting truth. One of the two needs to happen. Does that make sense to everyone? Once that happens, the fear will dissolve because you'll start dealing with the childhood emotions as to why you didn't want to hear the truth or say the truth or weren't allowed to say the truth or so forth. Once those are dealt with, you'll go around boldly saying truth to every single person you ever meet and you won't even worry at all about the consequences. Now that's what freedom is, isn't it? And what did I say in the first century? The truth sets you free. This is how it sets you free. How it sets you free is when there's no longer any emotional signature to you saying truth, now you're free. You're allowed to be who you are, to say who, say what you want, be what you want, every single person around you. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. So the, the prayer for this particular situation is actually recognizing the fear, admitting to the fear, yep. and experiencing the fear and offering that fear to God. Yep, or actually also start looking at what the childhood emotion is around truth, because that's the actual positive thing. Well, yes, that, that would be the next step. Yeah. But see, understand, fear is a emotion of self-deception. Yes. All of your fears, many of you have many fears now. How, how many of you would be afraid to uh, I don't know, jump off a 10-storey a, um, building? Be afraid? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid too. <laughs> but, it's, but I'm not facing a truth. The truth is, so down the track, when I'm a one with God, I'll be able to jump off a 10-story building at some point and fly, probably. Right? And I'll know when that will occur. And it will be because I've now accepted a new truth. And that new truth might be, ah, oh, now I understand there's a certain law of physics that I never understood before. It's not called the law of aerodynamics. And it's not the gravity of the law either. But it overcomes both. And once I understand that law, am I in fear anymore? No. Right? This applies all through your life. So, so 
when I face the truth, the fear dissolves. And that always is the case. But right now, if I jumped off a building, I'd hit the ground. Of course. That's why you're afraid. Because you don't know the truth. Can you see? The reason why you're afraid is you don't know the truth, and you know you don't know the truth. But the truth right now is I'd hit the ground. The truth is that, because you don't know the other truth. Yeah. The other truth is the other truth is this special law, the law of the, the, that overcomes the law of aerodynamics and the law of gravity that you don't know about. The ancients in like Lemuria and Atlantis, they knew about it, but you don't know about it. You don't know about that law, right? And because you don't know about the law, you know for certain that you're going to hit the ground and get a splat, right, when you jump off the building, as do I know at the moment, because I don't remember that law either. But there will come a time in your existence when you will remember that law. You will know that law. When you know that law, now that law becomes truth and the fear dissolves, doesn't it? You just step off the building like it's just a walk in the park, right? So truth is not necessarily absolute. It's what applies in the moment. It's what applies in the moment, yes, of course. So, so if, I'm, if I've got the truth inside of me about something that I know for certain emotionally is the truth, then I'm not going to have any fear about it at all. And you will get to a stage in your own progression where you will not be afraid of speaking the truth or living in truth at all. And when you get to that stage, you'll have entered the third sphere of the spirit world. <laughs> is that all somebody said? <laughs> Sorry, Pat. Do you want to say I'm just going to say that I, I, I knew a truth intellectually. You want to say it, I did. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, because I've been working around this issue, as you know, yeah. um, I view a truth intellectually, that truth will lead to love, if I'm in personal truth at all times. Yeah. It will trigger all of my emotions and eventually I'll become more in love. Um, so I prayed about that. I said, help me have faith and understand that truth will lead to love. Yeah. So you can you can know you can realise the truth even if it's intellectually and then pray about recognising that emotionally. Exactly. Yeah. Does that make sense? So for all of you who are afraid of speaking the truth, start praying about that. When you get to the point where you're no longer afraid of the truth and afraid of speaking the truth in every circumstance and situation, you'll have entered this third sphere of the spirit world. So you will know you'll never visit at hell unless you want to go there. Right, once you get to that condition. But does that tell you too how refined the spheres of the spirit world are? Doesn't it? What kind of lessons you would need to learn as you progress? What's the lessons of the second sphere? I don't want to go through all the lessons of every sphere. <laughs> Jenny? Um, well, I think that the truth is that I have committed adultery. I'm asking you. I really believe that by not going to the man's wife, if I went to his wife and confessed the truth, then it would perpetuate harm. Can you... I yeah, that, that's I, not true. I feel... I know you feel that. I fears and angry and grieved and saddened and just a multitude of things here... Um, but the truth will set you free, Jenny. So all of those emotions you just mentioned of guilt and shame, they all need to know the truth. All of them all need to know the truth. All of them need to know the truth. The reason why all of them need to know the truth is because the truth will set them free too. And because it's a personal thing, it's something that's going on in, for yourself, something that you yourself have done, it's very important that you face the personal truths. Very, very important. Does that mean that I can't progress in divine love until I recognize... You'll progress until the third sphere, and then you won't progress any longer until you address that particular issue. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Any sense? Does it matter if you know that with someone 
and now we're starting to get down the line of like, you know, I have an acquaintance and they, know, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, if it's a really good friend of yours, just raise the issue in a conversation with them. Do they want to know the truth of what happened? And if they don't want to, say that's fine. You know, they may not want to. So that's fine, that's their free will at work. If they want to know, then tell them the truth. That's fine too. But, but what, you will, what I'm saying really is, in your day-to-day -day life right now, there are issues of truth that hit you every day. What I'm saying is from now on, start practicing living in the truth of them. Right? And you'll find whatever emotions freak you out about speaking the truth are going to come up really rapidly. Does that make sense? And once you get through those emotions and come out the other side of the emotions, you'll be in the third sphere. Now that might take you six months or 12 months, but once you get through those emotions and come out the other side, you'll be in a really, really good state when it comes to <coughs> truth and love. I'm just a bit confused now. You're saying... We use the mic, maybe. And if we can use the mic up the back for the questions. Do you ask them for their... Do you want to hear the truth, or do you just tell them? I usually ask people whether they want to hear it. And that's better than... Like, there will come a time in your life where everything inside of you is a soul-to-soul -soul transaction. So here's your soul... That's you. Here's the other person. You won't ever have to ask the person whether they want to hear truth because you'll feel the emotion from them that they don't want to hear the truth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But that is still you honouring their free will. Now, at that stage, the majority of us are not in that... At, at this stage, the majority of us are not in that state, are we? Mm -hmm. We can't just look at somebody's soul, feel their emotion, and say, oh, yeah, they want to know the truth, and, and out with it. Most of us are not in that state yet. So if you're not in that state yet, use the words. Ask the person, do they want to hear the truth? Let yourself say. Most people will actually tell you they want to hear the truth, even when they don't. <laughs> okay? So like, for example, in the case that I gave you, if a person wants to hear the truth like of a cheating husband, and then they say they want to hear the truth, you tell them the truth, and then they ban you from their life for the rest of your life, then obviously they didn't want to hear the truth. But you don't know that. And what I'm saying is at this particular point in your development, you've got to stick by the laws of free will that you know as best you can at this point. And all development is like that. Do what you know to be true at this point. Um, and put it back to the moment. And I just want to say, so if in your heart, if you've done something that wasn't being truthful, do we have to go back to that and get that? Or do you just start things that are like now and be peaceful? Like, stop. It's a good question. Are you going to get penalised for that? Very good question. Very good question. You've got to listen to the answer. It's a good question. My answer is that your soul will tell you. It, the more you deal with your emotions, your soul won't be able to handle not going back. Exactly. And your soul loves truth. Once you start telling the truth, it triggers a lot of emotions, but then you're hooked. Yeah, you get sort of addicted to truth after a while, and you just can't help yourself. <laughs> because you're honouring yourself. Exactly. Exactly. That makes sense. And it doesn't mean you don't have compassion when you tell the truth to others either. You always have compassion. So, so the, when you deal with this issue of truth, you'll find yourself... If you're really repentant about it, firstly, the first thing you'll do is you'll pray to God about it. And you'll feel the feeling of repentance enter you. And then from that moment on, you'll be addressing issues of truth in your day-to-day -day life all the time without resistance. And you'll find that any unhealed previous thing that needs to be dealt with will be presented through your law of attraction to you again. And you need to let yourself deal with it. That will automatically happen, because remember, God's law is automatically there to help you heal your emotions. So that will automatically happen. So let yourself deal with all that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to mention about this issue of truth. The whole reason why I've got, I've got a whole day coming up, remember not uh, uh, I can't remember when I did that. Actually. It's either this month or next month. Talking about prayers for divine truth. Right? Because this subject of truth is such an important subject. 
So when we're talking about prayer for divine love and prayer for divine truth, specifically as issues, because they are very, very big issues in your own progression. So I just wanted to say that so that all of you are aware that there'll be a lot more said about this subject. Yes. Oh, hi, AJ. Um, I was just wanting some clarification with regards to prayer, um, with regards to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, my thing is about interfering with their free will, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure, like you mentioned before, you skipped over quite quickly and it didn't quite register in my head, mm -hmm. as to, um, like you, I think your example was uh, the soulmate, that um, you could ask the God to help them to be shown or through their well, it, it gets, Yeah, it gets like, back down to our motive. Yeah. Always back down to our motive. Well, it ends up being my motive, doesn't it? So that's where I go, okay, well, and if you're I'm praying for some... with their free will. Exactly. So maybe they don't want to, you know, it has to, like, and again, then also I'm not trusting God. Exactly. And I'm not giving him, you know, or us or every individual their opportunity to grow as they see fit. Exactly. So my question comes back again. How Are you do, asking if a question? I want to, <laughs> yeah, but if I want to um, yeah. say a prayer, say my father's ill, and, um, you know, I want to say a prayer for him, like he's sending him love and asking for God to protect him or whatever, is that a, that's interfering with No, always look at your motive. Right. Now let's look at our motives. Let's say our dad's ill and we're praying for our dad. What's my motive? Is my motive that I'm afraid of him dying? Is my motive is that I'm afraid of the pain that he's feeling? Is my motive that he won't love me as much if he's in more pain? Is my motive that he's actually angry with me while he's in this pain? What is my motive? Right? Now all of those motives I just listed are all unloving. And God can't hear the prayer on those bases. However, God can hear the prayer on the basis of my motive being loving. Please help my dad deal with the emotion that he's working through that causes his illness. It's a very loving prayer. If I know the emotion, I'd actually go and tell my dad what it is, even. That would be a loving thing to do. Right? So my motive is everything. What is my motive? If my motive is actually for selfish purposes, then I'm out of harmony with the law of free will. So if you're actually praying for God, um, ask God to show you the soul made or show the river that you're praying for the emotion behind it, that's how you incur no repentance and you don't well, no. their free will. Remember I just said it depends on your motive. Mm. So if my motive for doing that is that I want my soul made to love me, well, then it's a selfish motive. <laughs> If my motive is that I just love my soulmate and want my soulmate to progress, now it's not a selfish motive. See, this is where we've got to be so... You see what I'm saying to you? You can see the difference between sincerity and insincerity, right? Now, the more loving we become, the more sincere we become and the more pure our motive becomes. So initially, when we start off in the first fear, a lot of our motives are very impure. They're not really loving. Most of our motives are quite self-based. Yes. But as we progress and receive more divine love, our motives become more pure. So, And God understands this too. <laughs> right? He gets the bit that our motive was, and when it was pure, he feels that bit. And he resonates with that bit that was pure, and acts upon that bit that was pure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He doesn't act upon all the bits that are not very pure. It doesn't really matter how you say it. It's, 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 it doesn't matter how you say it. Well, remember I say that prayer is the emotion, not the thought. So it doesn't matter how you're saying it, what is your motive? Does that make sense to everyone? What is your feeling behind the prayer? That's the thing that matters. That is, in fact, the real condition, the real reason why you're even praying, is the feeling behind the prayer. Yeah. Uh, just wait for the I microphone. Can you wait for the microphone? Thank you. All right. I appreciate very much that you want to make a community, yep. but I would suggest and it's my desire that we have a counselling centre because we need it. But so think about that because that's more need. I feel that that we all of us need counselling and help. In the same time, we can be in the community. How, how many of you are already counsellors or psychiatrists or 
involved in counselling and helping others? Right. How many of you, yeah, keep your hands up, how many are involved in even things like Reiki and all those kind of things as well? Spiritual healing and all those kind of things? Right, good half the audience. You can set up a counselling centre. <laughs> and I'm happy to give you advice. I'm happy to give you advice, but I'm not going to be doing it myself. That's not why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to tell divine truth. <laughs> Ten, thanks. My dad is ill in the hospital. He had a stroke Tuesday. Yep. Yep. Um, can, I, I can I just stop you for a second? Yep. Why are you sad? Because I'm, I'm fearful about a lot of things. I'm fearful that um, he's not going to be around. Yep. But since then, I've been praying to God to help him through his law of attraction to feel his emotions because I want him to pass over in the best emotional state that he can. But I am very fearful of talking to him about his emotions and what Mary said before about trusting um, that the truth will lead to love. That brought up a lot of emotion in me yeah. because... I honestly don't think that by telling my father the truth that it's going to lead to love, even though as much as I'd, I'd love to be able to believe that. Yeah. And also, because of my financial situation at the moment, one of my other fears which shocked the heck out of me was, don't you dare die so that my law of attraction will give me money after you die because I'm scared of not having any money. Yeah. So, so so let's address some of the issues from a prayer point of view. Firstly, the prayer that that dad you know deals with his emotions at the moment is motivated by some selfish emotions inside of yourself, right? A lot of fear, a lot of fear and a lot of those. So it's motive, the motive is fear within yourself. Right? If the motive is fear, is it love? No. Simple as that, just no. Now, if the motive is fear, the prayer you need to be praying about is, please help me look at my fears about my father, you know, and his illness, is the first thing that you need to be starting addressing with, with God. Does that make sense? Once you let yourself work through all of them, you will actually get to a state where you can pray for your father, but actually the motive be based on love. And so many of the comments that you made as what you were praying to God about, actually God couldn't hear because at the moment, it's coming from a different place. Is it? Yeah. So the key is to start addressing that issue with God. Does that make sense for everyone? That's in? For most of us, what we're doing is we're addressing issues with God that we're not actually feeling at the time. In other words, we want God to change our external environment so that we don't feel the fear that we feel. But actually, the external environment is actually there through your law of attraction so that you feel the fear you're feeling and work your way through it and get to something deeper. Does that make sense? So what God wants in this situation, what you want in this situation, is totally the opposite thing. So can God answer those prayers? No. All God can do is allow the fear in you to build even more and build even more until you realise, actually, I am just so terrified about whatever it is. And I need to deal with that. That's the thing I need to pray for. So that's what, in this case, you need to do. So many times I see, even on the internet, you know, like where pe people are saying, oh, such and such just passed. Pray for them. Why? Why didn't you pray for them before they passed? Why? Because you didn't care about them as much before they passed and afterwards. Why? Can you see what I'm saying? Because... Obviously, you didn't think about them that much until they passed. Why? <laughs> because you're probably scared of passing yourself. That's probably why. You know? And allow yourself to feel your way through all of that emotion. Then. You see what I'm saying? Like, often our motives for doing things are way, way out of harmony with love. So when I hear people say things like, I, I see quite often posted different things on different forums, not very much now because I don't read much of that, um, 
I see quite often in the past ones where, oh, such and such have passed, please pray for them, or such and such is very ill, please, please pray for them. My feeling is, why aren't you praying for them already? When they were not, you know, unwell, for example. When they weren't passed, why weren't you praying for them then? Can you see, sometimes, if we ask that question, we will often see the motive that we have. And it's the motive we have that needs to be addressed. I wrote a lot about fear last night mm -hmm. because yesterday I said to Nada, because I live with her, um, a lot has happened in the last three weeks but I don't think I've been emotional enough for it. There must be a lot of fear there. Yeah. So thanks to my law of attraction, it's Another started. Another fear event. Yeah. yeah. We will talk more about fear when we talk about this uh, subject of emotions of self-deception. Because fear is an emotion of self-deception. Uh, and we need to talk a lot more about those kind of emotions. Um, you notice over the page, uh, under the section uh, on the third page, I've got what will not be heard by God. I just want to go through a few of those. Because many of you have already asked questions about this. So one of the things, that, notice the last thing on the list is God will not hear prayers where you refuse to do what you're asking God to do. I'll say that again. God will not hear a prayer where you're asking God to do something that you personally refuse to do. I'm not saying that you can't do because of circumstances. I'm saying that you refuse to do. So, for example, um, an example, um, there are so many examples, actually. There's just, there's just like, what did I put in the thing there? Uh, yeah, just like... Train to go for a job change, or is that what you meant? Yeah. Um, then when refuse to leave the job we are in because of emotional anger. Yeah, so let's look at that one, the job change thing. So I'm praying to God, I'm praying to God for a change of job because I hate my job. So I keep saying to God, I hate my job, I want to change my job. And and so I'm waiting for God to bring up another job for me. It's basically what I'm doing, isn't it? But how can God do that? Like, you're not willing to take any action in harmony with your prayer. So how's God going to do that? Like, are you just going to sit there and twiddle your thumbs and wait till God arranges everything and the other things for you without you actually making an action? Now, what you refuse to do is often what you need to learn. So God is often trying to teach us, well, actually, no, you can do this for yourself, actually. You don't need me for this one. Right? You can do this one for yourself because your law of attraction is so powerful. Once you set your intention and once you really go for it, bang, everything will just happen. All of my laws are already nursing you. That's really what God's saying to us, right, in this situation. All of my laws are really nursing you. All you need to do is, do I like this job? No. Should I be in it? No. Stop straight away. What job do I like? Ah, oh, I like riding bikes around, so I'll go and find a job that so I can do that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and exercise your design attention, and because of all that, now you're also praying, right? Remember, prayer is about the soul. Soul is about desire, passion, longing. You're praying right at that instant. That makes sense. So oftentimes what we're doing is we pray to God because we want God to sort something out for us that we didn't want to sort out ourselves. God doesn't answer that kind of stuff very well. Because God's there waiting for us to work out the fact that actually, you know, hang on a sec, you created what you've got right now. You need to feel the pain of the creation of what you created. And then once you feel that, maybe you'll decide to do something different. Now, if I start praying, what is the reason why I'm staying in a job that I don't like? I want to feel the feelings of why I'm staying in a job I don't like. Now God can answer that really, really well for us, can't he? Because now we're starting to deal with the cause of what's actually going on. Does that make sense? So oftentimes we ask God to do things that we personally refuse to do. The key is to stop doing that. Right? 
and start looking at the emotional reasons why you refuse to do it. Pray about that instead. You notice the one above that. We are often ask God to fix what we've created. This is sort of like an extension of that. So, you know, like our marriage is breaking down. We want our partner to come to some realizations that he's hurting us. Right? But who created this relationship? God? No. I did. I did create this relationship. Now, God's perfectly willing for me to work through the issues of why the relationship isn't working and perfectly willing to help me do that. But he's not going to take away the effects of my creation. To do that, he'd have to break the law of cause and effect. And he'd have to break the law of compensation. And he'd have to break, like, there's quite a few laws he'd have to break just to do that. God's not going to do that. Can you see how it works? Yeah. In, a, in a work situation... Say you're being abused by a fellow colleague. Yep. Would in that situation, if you wanted to pray for God to release that, would you have to feel like not being liked and all that emotion and releasing <coughs> experiences to, to release to God? Yes, then that's the, right. Then the law of attraction or law will change. Will change. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, the law of attraction might be just a simple thing of why are you staying in a job where somebody's harming you. And a lot of times what we do is we prostitute ourselves in that way. We stay in something that's harming us because we haven't learned to love ourselves yet. So it might not be the law of attraction because of uh, other issues. It might be just that we haven't learned to love ourselves yet, that it's being triggered. The key is to let yourself work your way through that emotionally. Pray to God about the issue and you will find what the issue really is within you. Also, on that note, does that come back from a childhood? Always. Always from a childhood thing. Yeah, always. So... At the causal level, we'd be asking for God to show us what this is triggering in me. What's the feeling is triggering me? I want to know what that feeling is. Oh, it's anger, and then it's this, and it's that, whatever the emotions are. And then I'd say, what kind of relationship does this have to issues in my own childhood? And you'd probably find a relationship between a father doing that to you, in your case, yes, and, uh, and so forth. Good. Notice uh, prayers that harm others or the environment. And I've heard of people saying a prayer to curse a person. <laughs> How many times have you felt like that? <laughs> and, and, and in fact, the person was then cursed. In other words, the person then got a sickness and they died from it. Or the person then got you know, some kind of illness. And... Now, was God doing that? No. So who was? A spirit, a spirit yeah. So, so many times, and, and this happens a lot in more spiritualistic cultures, like the Aboriginal culture, a lot of the African cultures, a lot of the Asian cultures, where, where direct spirit influence is involved in harming the other person at, at a person's wish. Right? It's certainly not God doing that. God doesn't answer prayers to cause the harm of other people. Very, very low-level spirits answer those prayers uh, in order to carry out your wishes. Right. So you've all heard of really negative uh, things like witchcraft, and I'm not talking about so-called, like, the white witchcraft, I suppose you'd call it nowadays. I'm talking about the real black evil stuff, which is about harming other people, controlling, manipulating events, and all those kind of things. All voodoo-type things, yep. All of those things which are rife still in the world today are not prayers to God or to Satan. They are actually desires of the person enabled with spirit, people with spirit who are spirits and the two desires converge and the spirit does all they can to harm the person. Prayers for protection against that, of course God answers. But deal with the emotional reason why you need the protection in the first place. Because no spirit can harm you unless there is an emotional connection between you and the spirit. But God always answers prayers for those, that kind of protection. As long as we're willing to look at our law of attraction. Then of course God can answer those prayers. What about uh, repetition? Heartless repetition? Okay. The Lord's Prayer said over and over again. It makes a real sanctimonious. 
Of course, that's not the case. Does that make sense? That's not the case at all. So don't get involved in prayers that just go mindless, endless repetition. Go into the emotion. Let yourself settle with the emotion. Don't think that you can demand something of God. You know, do a negotiation with God. You know, uh, if I do this for you, God, will you do this for me? That kind of thing. Right. Probably. Thank you. So, so don't think you can get into that state where you can, where you can negotiate with God. A lot of people try negotiating with God. Have you noticed that? Uh, how many times have you done it in the past? Yeah, where you said, "Ah." Oh, if I do this for you, God, will you do that for me? <laughs> that kind of thing. And now this is going to sound quite harsh, perhaps, but often we even do this right down with really big diseases and illnesses, where we say, oh, if you cure me of this disease, I'll then do your will, or something like that. Can you follow me? Now, God doesn't answer those prayers. Because it's not dealing with, well, there's literally 50 reasons probably why God doesn't answer one of those prayers. But the key thing for us to bear in mind is that we have emotions within us where we feel we can manipulate God into doing what we want. And we need to feel those emotions and work through those emotions. Because the truth is we can't manipulate God. God is unnegotiable. That doesn't mean God's unloving. It means that God is unnegotiable with regard to breaking any laws. You know, nowadays, you know, you pay a bit of extra money uh, to someone on the table, you get a bit of a kickback, you know, and get a bit of extra service, you know. Well, God doesn't do that either. <laughs> uh, you can't just pay extra money to God and God gives you a bit of extra service or, you know. So all of these things that have been presented in the past in many religions of you know, paying extra to get out of purgatory and all those kind of things, all of those things are obviously not motivated of, out of truth or love. And that it's impossible to do those things. God doesn't change God's laws. Uh, what do you mean ask God for a sign? Does that mean... Ask God for a sign? <laughs> yes. Um, what for? I can't remember on the scene that I asked about being my soulmate to show me a sign. Yep. Show me a sign that this person is my soulmate. Yep. Okay. And so, sign, like, what would the sign be like? <laughs> yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, your sign is a red ribbon. Your sign is a red ribbon. Yeah. Okay. When you're asking these kind of questions, it's your guides often that are interacting with you, right? And so there's some friends I know that uh, she has, any time she sees multiple twos, she knows she should take notice of something. Multiple what? Twos, like two, 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 two something, like something like that. She knows she should take notice of something that's going on. Of course, most of the time she doesn't take notice of it or deal with it emotionally. But this happens to her so frequently in her life, she's now learned that that's the way her guides are trying to communicate with her a sign about something. But, you know, they're not probably going to answer the question. But they may give you a sign in order to deal with some emotions. Does that make sense? Now, um, most of the time we ask for signs is because we're not trusting our own emotions. And one of the things that all of your celestial guides want to do with you is teach you how to trust yourself. And are you trusting yourself when you're relying on them? No. Are you relying on God when you're relying on them? No. No. So a lot of these things of signs are all about us not yet being developed emotionally enough to know the truth about it. So isn't it better to ask for things like, I feel this person may be my soulmate. Show me what emotions I need to work through to know the truth. That would be more beneficial to prayer, wouldn't it? Rather than asking for a sign. Because, you know, if they just give you a sign, you just say, oh yeah, he's my soulmate. And so you get into this relationship, and he's a sleazebag at the moment, right? I'm not saying he is, but... <laughs> but let's say, you know, 
And and if you loved yourself, you wouldn't even be with this man, even if he is your soulmate. Does that make sense? But because somebody has told you he's your soulmate, you go into the relationship. Now, obviously, that wouldn't be beneficial to you, right? So, so this is where the principles of truth and love need to be practiced in the lot in your life. So, rather than asking yourself those kind of questions, you're far better off asking yourself things like and asking God things like. What emotions in me are unhealed that prevent me from meeting my soul? Please show me those emotions and help me work through those emotions. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That would be a far more powerful thing to do. Because the truth is, if one of your guys or even God gave you a sign that somebody is your soulmate and the person is in a poor condition, there's a high likelihood you would compromise other principles at the moment to be with them. And that wouldn't be beneficial to your soul at all. So that means that I, I, I said to God, um, I'm willing to deal with this, this issue um, if you take away the, attract, the, the law of attraction stuff. But that's making a demand, is it? Certainly. God's not going to take away the law of attraction. Ever. God, it's one of God's beautiful messengers to you that you're either in harmony or out of harmony with God. But if I say, okay, I get it now, I've got, I've got this, I'm going to deal with it, I am dealing with this. Yep. Is God's it? not going to take it away then either. <laughs> it's going to go away automatically when you deal with it. You see, often what we do is we negotiate with God. We say, I know what the issue is now. I'll deal with it next week. Can you please take away my law of attraction? <laughs> God's not going to do that. Like, God's not going to do that. And you can see why. Because everybody would be praying for their law of attraction to be taken away if it's negative. And then nobody would be listening to it and all be getting away with their own law of attraction. God doesn't do things like that. When Your law of attraction will change when your soul has released the emotion. That's the only time it's going to change. And you can pray till you blue in the face for your law of attraction to change before then, and it will not. So I need to pray to work out what that emotion is. You need to pray to work out the emotion is, but you also need to pray to thank God for the law of attraction. Okay. See, at the moment, many of us are actually cursing God for the law of attraction, <laughs> aren't we? But if we're in pain, we feel the pain of our law of attraction, oftentimes we get into this state of, ah, ah, you know, why can't God stop this law of attraction? When in reality, what we need to do is embrace our law of attraction. Because... Our law of attraction, remember, is God's messenger of truth to us. So God's not going to take away our law of attraction. Yeah, God will never do that. You can take away your law of attraction. She's quite getting on and dealing with this emotion. You know? yeah. Yeah. Now, it's uh, nearly half past, so I need to stop all questions now. Obviously, there's a few other things I haven't covered with that prayer discussion. And uh, if you can have a look at them and have a ponder about them, Meditate about them a bit. Oh, one thing I'd like to mention is uh, Ian has made some. <laughs> There's five in the bag that Ian has brought for a present. So, and there's some more coming tomorrow if you'd like to have some more. There's five going. Five, 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 five. Ah, yes, someone else. What? Now, what just happened there? What just happened there? I was offering, I was offering, and what was going on? You were waiting for me to... Can you see what was happening with desire there? Can you see that? It was when it was when somebody actually came up and exercised desire, and they received. Important message. Um, Thank you very much, people, for your... uh...